Starbucks Iced Apple Crisp Oat Milk Shaken Espresso. Made with blonde espresso, creamy oat milk, and spiced apple flavors. It's an icy crisp sip you can enjoy all autumn long. Order ahead on the Starbucks app. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify is there to help you grow. Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, and sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. What I love about Shopify is how no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash westwood1. All lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash westwood1 now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash westwood1. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. See ebaymotors.com. Welcome to Orioles on the Verge. This is Zach Spedden's win as always by Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens. And on tonight's episode, we're going to look back at the Bowie Bay Sox 2024 season, which wrapped up over the weekend, we're now down to just one Orioles minor league affiliate. That's the Norfolk Tides. They're going to play out their 2024 slate this week. But the Double A season is in the books. And while the Bay Sox finished below 500, they had a very good pitching staff and some interesting hitters that rolled through there along the way this season. So we're going to break that down on this episode. First, Orioles on the Verge is presented by Bet Online. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football. Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads to bet on during the games. Think you know your stuff? Get in our $200,000 mega contest and pick five games against the spread every week for your chance at weekly prizes and a share of 200 k When the game's over, head on over to our online casino and get on a game of blackjack or poker or on wine with one of our over 150 slots games. Head to the website today to get in on the action. Bet online. The game starts here. As I mentioned, the Bowie Bay Sox season is now in the books. They did finish well below 500 with a 62 and 75 record. However, we saw plenty of highlights, which is reflected in their pitching staff setting a franchise record with a combined 1,319 strikeouts as a team. This season, they also had the fourth best ERA in the Eastern League. And there were a lot of highlights, too, to talk about among their position players. But in our continuing theme of the year of the pitcher in the minor leagues, which we devoted a lot of time to last week when we broke down high A Aberdeen season, Bowie was also a big part of that. Whether it was players that were there for most of the year or later additions like Pat Riley, plenty of good pitchers took the mound with the Bay Sox this year. And we'll start with that part of the roster. Nick, I think we knew going into this year that the Bay Sox on paper had a pretty good pitching staff. Then you add in someone like Riley or someone who got there even earlier, like Cam Weston, and it was a pretty good group. Yeah, this staff was... Parts of the season, I will admit, it did look kind of bumpy uh, for some of these guys, but like Alex Pham in particular. like Alex Pham, those last two or so months of the season was probably statistically the best pitcher in this entire system. Uh, That was the Alex fam that we were hoping to see at the beginning of the year to take this big jump and build on what he did last year when he was in the running for like minor league pitcher of the year last year in his true breakout uh, or real breakout last year. Um, 
the addition of Pat Riley was really awesome. Uh, I think it's pretty cool that he likes to go by Pat uh, instead of Patrick. Uh, we got Pat Riley in the system. He, I, I'm so I'm gonna wait on Riley just to see like what the Orioles do with him in the off season. He was really good since the trade deadline, and he instantly slotted in our top 50 list as one of the top pitching prospects in the organization. Shout out to Billy Cook for doing fantastic things with the Pirates in the major leagues right now. Uh, seen a lot of Billy Cook chatter online, and it's awesome to see. But we traded a lot of pitching prospects at the trade deadline, and to be able to replenish that with Pat Riley was pretty awesome. But I want to see what the Orioles do with him this offseason and see what he looks like uh, at the start of next year to get a, a much better pitcher. But yeah, Cameron Weston over and over again, like we talk about. No one else is talking about this kid. Uh, and he finally put together his first healthy season as a pro, and it was one of the more dominant performances we saw in, in this entire farm system. Um, I mean, there are a lot of guys. Unfortunately, you know, Zach Peak went down to injury. We didn't get to see Gene Pinto this year because he had Tommy John surgery. Uh, you know, but Kyle Branovich was up and down with the injuries. It, he comes back and he went had like two or three IL stints. We don't know what for. Um, and Trace Bright, I feel like Bright, I don't want to say Bright was the biggest disappointment for me this year. He just, he didn't take the next step when I thought there were a lot of signs coming into this year that he was going to take that next step. He didn't. And then those last two months or so of the year, he, I think he regressed with the control and the walks again, but overall, yeah, a lot of positive takeaways from, from this pitching stuff. Yeah. Bright. Oh, and 11. You can't even win a baseball game. Like <laughs> get rid of him. No, yeah, it was a little disappointing just because even the data from his spring training appearance was like kind of like, whoa, like <laughs> I see why they like him so much. So hopefully, you know, that's still in there. Hopefully they, he can just learn from this and take it to the to the next level next year, whether it's repeating double A before going to triple A or starting in Norfolk. We'll see. Pat Riley. Yeah, um, he had some fantastic outings. What was it uh, last week? His I think he had two starts. The first one was like four innings, eight strikeouts, no walks. Um, one of those times. So Alex Pham started off really poorly, but was the Alex Pham we knew and fell in love with last year for pretty much the entire second half of the season. That was awesome to see him come back. Peter Van Loon, last chance at uh, becoming something in the system, it seems like, and he took advantage of that at the, at the second half of the year. Yeah, Cameron Weston, I mean, a whip barely over one, a strikeout, to walk rate of more than four to one 92 innings at double a was awesome to see a low to mid threes era just gotta love the the starting pitching in, in buoy and even in the relief corps here uh keegan gillies and dylan hyde gillies you know he was very inconsistent but still struck out 54 batters in 47 innings and i like his stuff from the way he comes over the top at such a, a tall height. And Dylan Hyde, 1.69 ERA over 64 innings. That was cool to see. So hopefully those guys can start in Norfolk and be some legit relief options at some point in 2025. So, yeah, I think you're the pitcher. It really was from double A down, with, other than a few people uh, sprinkled in from triple A. And, yeah, it was uh, it lived up to the hype. Yeah. I Going back to Bright for a moment, I could honestly sit here for a half hour, 45 minutes and go over Bright's stats, and I'm not going to do that because it's so odd to me when you look at some of his performances later in the year, he was walking guys at a really high rate, not missing bats, despite the fact that it often seemed like outing, outing to outing, the stuff looked the same. Now, it should tell you how much Bright struggled with his command down the stretch when in the month of August he held opposing hitters to a 175 average, yet he still had a 4.5 ERA in 18 innings uh, over that stretch, 14 walks. And you had a lot of some outings in there where he was nearly walking as many guys as he struck out or sometimes walking more than he struck out. So I can't quite pinpoint what happened with him Bam, it was great to see his resurgence in the second half. I think that he has to be at least in the conversation right now for a 40-man roster spot because he is Wolf 5 eligible this offseason. But Weston, that's one of the big breakout stories 
in the minor leagues this year. You know, we liked Weston a lot based off of what he showed at Aberdeen last year, but he had missed time because of an injury. So he got a late start to last year. So it was kind of like, all right, let's see what he does over a full season. And he just got better every step of the way. And I think that when you look at the, the way he pits in the two places side by side, he was really better in Bowie than he was in Aberdeen. And he was dominant at Aberdeen. Yeah, I agree. And again, he was kind of like the Alex Fam of 2024, where last year, even though he was starting games, I, I looked at him more as a relief prospect long term. And the way he pitched once he got up to double A Bowie, I'm I'm much less so on that train and more, hey, this is a mid to back end of the rotation starter potentially. So yeah. Great, great season. Got to be in the running for minor league pitcher of the year for the Orioles. Yeah, and I think I've pointed this out before, probably in like a one of the top fifty updates we did. But what I liked about Weston's season, if you look at his numbers, he was always like fifty five, fifty eight percent ground ball rate pitcher at his previous stops, and that ground ball rate dropped to forty four percent this season in a very home run friendly ballpark down there in Bowie yet he was still dominant. The home run rate didn't explode. It was one per nine. Like that's nothing. That's nothing terrible at all, but the strikeouts down a tick down to still 28%, but he walked fewer guys. Opponents hit barely 200 against him. I think the ERA was, was the year 3.41 FIP and XFIP were pretty much in line there. Like, I think this kid's the real deal. I do. I do agree that his performance this year and watching him, I think he's got a pretty sturdy floor as a reliever with his kind of unique delivery. He's got, you know, I don't even know how many pitches this guy has, five, six, seven different pitches, different arm angles. I think he's got that sturdy floor as a reliever. But yeah, I'm viewing Cameron Weston as this guy should be in Norfolk's rotation to start uh, 2025 and be in contention at some point, maybe at the end of next year. Like if, if you need a bullpen arm, he could be the Brandon Young next year that we're talking about. Does he get a shot? Um, Great year for Weston and Gillies. Yeah, talk about him real quick just because the numbers weren't good. I think he started out the year pretty hot and then went on kind of a cold stretch there. Obviously, a reliever, you have two or three bad outings, it's really going to skew your final numbers. But he's also older, he's about to turn 27 years old. But this guy is six eight with like a three pitch mix. Baseball America having him ranked as a 13th ranked prospect is a little crazy, I think, in my opinion. But I still think Gillies is a pretty strong uh, relief only prospect in the system. He's not going to start games. He's, he's They're not going to stretch him out. That's done. But he's a five year bullpen guy at Tulane. He missed what 2022 season because of an injury. He only pitched like 10 innings or so. So, yeah, he's older and still only at double A coming off a statistically not the greatest year, but. Six eight guy in in the mold of a Felix Batista. I'm I'm gonna give him another shot uh, next year and, and see what happens. And I just want to shout out real quick uh, for the pitchers, Houston Roth. Like, give Houston Roth a little love. I don't know how the Orioles view him. 2019 draft pick out of Ole Miss. This guy, like, <laughs> he's a full time reliever now. His first two years, two three years as a pro, they worked him as a starter mostly. But he was in Bowie all year in their bullpen. Strikeout rate went up. Like walks went down a tick. Career best ERA, 3.35. FIP and XFIP right there in line as well. With Roth, like he had a really, really good year out of Bowie's bullpen uh, that uh, did not go unnoticed by us. So shout out to Houston Roth for a career year. You going to sign up for a Roth IRA? <laughs> Might as well at this point, man. This, I, I, again, I don't know. Um, it was pretty cool to see a lot of those bullpen arms like Roth, Bradley Brammer. I thought for a stretch there was like, oh, okay, Bradley Brammer having a breakout. I think he kind of stumbled there at the end of the year. But Bowie has a lot of older bullpen arms, but they're definitely like unique options that I that I think are, are definitely going to be worth a look uh, next year in Norfolk's bullpen. Well, especially last thing, uh, was it Jacob Hernandez, 28-year-old, who the Orioles signed as a minor league free agent, was hurt most of the year, has pitched like a month in Bowie, and is just, obviously, he's 28 and in Bowie, but he's coming back from an injury. I'm kind of intrigued. He was uh, dominant so far in this little stretch of a season. My dad works in B2B marketing. 
He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Starbucks Iced Apple Crisp Oat Milk Shake and Espresso. Made with blonde espresso, creamy oat milk, and spiced apple flavors. It's an icy crisp sip you can enjoy all autumn long. Order ahead on the Starbucks app. Every day, our world gets a little more connected, but a little further apart. But then, there are moments that remind us to be more human. Thank you for calling Amica Insurance. Hey, uh, I was just in an accident. Don't worry, we'll get you taken care of. At Amica, we understand that looking out for each other isn't new or groundbreaking. It's human. Amica, empathy is our best policy. Let's go to a question from Vivek, uh, who's watching us on YouTube. He points out Alex Pham, Peter Van Loon, Dylan Hyde, and Keegan Gillies are all Rule 5 eligible this offseason. Are we going to protect anyone in that group? I'll start with Bob. Gillies and Hyde, I'd say no, unless there's a GM of like the Rockies who just is a Baseball America enthusiast, then maybe they grab him. But I think uh, relief prospects that are ending the year in AA probably not going to get picked in the Rule 5. Van Loon, I'm not protecting him. I think that's kind of like a, what's the guy, uh, Gray Fenter. That's kind of like, I, I wouldn't be shocked if someone took him in the Rule 5, but if they do, I think he'd be back. Fam, that's the tough one for me. I think I could see it going either way. It just depends. I mean, like there is a lot of guys that are replaceable right now on the 40-man roster, so if if they think they can make room for him, I would not be shocked because he should start next year in AAA Norfolk's rotation and be there all year unless he's needed in the majors. So I could see it with him if they think his second half is a sign of things to come. Yeah, Fam's the only one that I'm thinking about. He's, I don't know, I feel like with Fam, you know, he's an undersized arm. So like how many other teams, like, yeah, he's got a lot of the traits that the Orioles covet. They think, they, they identify these guys and they don't care where you pitch. They don't care if it's Seattle, San Francisco, whatever small college is out there that they're finding these guys from the Juco ranks. They don't care where you pitch. If they have the traits that they covet, they're going to bring you in and they're finding a lot of success with these guys down on the farm, turning a lot of these college relievers into starting pitching prospects. Fam being, I think the leader of that group, he does have back-to-back years where he's pitched over a hundred innings. So that arm is, is ready to go. I, just, I don't know. When I think about the Rule 5 draft, I'm not as concerned anymore about like losing some of these guys in the Rule 5 because I don't think as many guys get selected in the Rule 5 draft anymore. And if I'm thinking of you know, guys who haven't even reached AAA, I, I, I'm thinking it from an Orioles perspective. We always see the Orioles, they want to see their guys graduate from each level. Obviously, other organizations aren't like that. So they could see FAM having 100 plus innings last year, 119 innings this year back-to-back really great years they could like what they saw as well and say like yep he's going to be in the we feel confident he could be in the pros next year but when i think of the rule five draft i think of guys like does he have that like elite tool to where a team could be like we can stash him on the major league roster all year and like it's i don't know a wicked slider like you just throw the slider nothing else and we're gonna try to protect you this year and keep you around and and save you I don't think Fam has that as much as I love him as a pitching prospect in this organization. I don't see like the elite standout tools that another team would like gravitate to. Um, but I, 
I, I would lean towards no. They probably don't protect him, but we'll see, I guess. Yeah, I think the only player who has Rule 5 eligibility that's a lock to be protected this offseason, or at least among the first time Rule 5 eligible, is Brandon Young. But I, with these four, I can make a case for Gillies or Fam because Gillies has elite stuff. Fam has, I think, the highest floor and the highest ceiling in the group because he's the only one that I look at and think he might be able to stick in the back end of a major league bullpen. He's got a good curveball. Um, he doesn't necessarily have eye popping velocity, but he's got a good curveball. Maybe there's enough there for him to be a reliever. But I do wonder if the fact that none of these guys have triple A time is going to come into the equation because chances are there's going to be enough unprotected starters and relievers with at least some triple A time among the other 29 teams that fam. And Gillies could be fairly high on the depth chart if they're left unprotected. Or kind of like last year when we thought the Orioles were going to lose someone and they didn't. You look at who gets left unprotected by the other 29 teams. You're like, oh, wow, this is actually a fairly deep class. There is no way that these guys are going to be taken ahead of you know these 10 pitchers. Yeah, say it, Vivek, in the chat. The Tampa Bay Rays, I think, kept a, a few good pitchers that uh... – probably could have been selected uh, i'm trying to think of the lefty that is dominating a triple a for them right now but yeah the point stands let's go to the offense now and i want to start with dylan beavers because beavers we learned has been promoted to triple a norfolk and in fact by the time this episode comes out he will have made his triple a debut most likely and his time at Bowie was interesting this year because basically to a very good start and a pretty good final two weeks book ended what was a very up and down summer for Beavers. He showed more power, which is one of the things we absolutely wanted to see from him when he returned to double A this year. But the hit tool leaves a lot of questions at this point. And it's something we've talked about on here before, which is that we know that if Beavers can put everything together, he has the floor of at least a really solid everyday right fielder in the major leagues. But are the tools going to come together? Are, are the Orioles ever going to quite be able to get the swing right? There were a lot of points this year where if you watch Beavers, you would think, no, there's a lot of issues here they still need to work with. Or if you happen to catch him on a good night, he's an on-base machine who takes really good at bats and is showing a little bit of power. And you start to really see the potential. So, Nick, I'll start with you. How do you kind of evaluate Beavers given the ups and downs that we saw this year? And where do you stand on him as he gets this tune up at Norfolk to end next year and probably now will be Norfolk's opening day right fielder next year? Yeah, Beavers, Beavers and Bright are in the same boat for me this year down there in Bowie. Uh, just kind of stayed the course, I think. Be I, Beavers gets a passing grade for me for the year. That's for sure. I thought he was. I just thought he was primed for a big breakout this year after he got promoted to double A last year and destroyed double A pitching. A 150 WRC plus through 34 games was pretty outrageous. But this year just kind of stayed the course. His home runs came in bunches at the beginning of the year, and then he went on a long stretch with no power. He ended up with 15 home runs, though, and a 118 WRC plus. So, like, 18% above league average is pretty solid. Uh, decent pop. He doesn't strike out a ton. He's got a 13% walk rate this year. So he continues to be a walk machine. He was also 31 for 36 in stolen base attempts. Like He has a lot of tools that really stand out. It's just a matter of can he put them all together consistently. That, that was the big issue there. I, was it this year, too, that he had some like crazy on base streak as well as like 20, 30-something games? Like, that's what he does. Um, you know, at the getting promoted to AAA... I feel like I don't know how much it really means, but he gets one more week of games. He gets to familiarize himself with Harbor Park for a little bit. I feel like if the Orioles weren't as satisfied with his year, I know a lot of guys, I think most guys are down in Sarasota right now, still working out. You see some of the, especially you know, the younger international players still posting highlight videos online because with their uh, at bats down in Sarasota right now. I feel like they would have just maybe sent him home with this offseason plan or sent him to Sarasota to continue working on some things that they didn't like this year. But instead, they're like, go to Harvard Park. Uh, get six more games in. 
familiarize yourself because like you said you're gonna be the starting right fielder down there next year i don't i just he stayed steady for me all year i didn't drop him in my rankings maybe one or two spots but that's with the addition of draft picks and your know, trades i didn't want to push him up he just kind of stayed the course this year he got off to a great start then he had a long slump or just middling he was mid for a while as the kids say but the last month or so last 25 games of the year from august 14th until sunday he actually had a 152 wrc plus batted 292 with an 885 ops had the same walk rate 13.3 percent strikeout rate was actually cut down by like three or four percent from his season average at 19 percent so at least getting the promotion on a high note and yeah i think just the consistency that's what it is like he he shows flashes and he's always going to get on base he's always gonna steal some bases over 30 stolen bases i think that's like an underrated part of his game is his speed starting to show the power a little bit more in games at least towards the end of the year so i think kyle tucker light might be overselling it a little bit but the upside is there for sure. Um, between him and Judd Fabian, you would hope at least one of those guys will will click next year and get a shot at some point in the major leagues. I don't know that any prospect made more of a statement of Bowie this year, at least on the position player side, than Samuel Basayo. Expectations for him coming into this season were very, very high after his first full year of pro ball in 2023 in which he played at three different levels, ending at double A. He had a week-long cameo there at the end of the season, just like the one Beavers is about to get at Norfolk. And because of an injury, Basayo did get off to a little bit of a slow start this year at the plate. But when he caught fire, he did so in a big way. In 106 games with the Bay Sox, before his promotion to AAA, he hit 289 with an 820 OPS, belting 16 home runs. He's pretty much now a consensus top 10, top 15 prospect in the game. I think that all things considered, this year has gone about as well for him as you could have hoped. And a big part of that was his success at Bowie. So we'll probably talk a little bit more about Pasayo when we recap Norfolk's season. But I think now is a good time to discuss him because Bowie is where he spent the most time this year and really solidified his status as a prospect. Nick, I'll start with you. What stood out about Pasayo's performance during his time in Double A? Everything. Like we've said, he's reaching that point of Gunner and Jackson Holiday where it's like, what else can we say about this guy? At least with Basayo, you know, you got the defensive questions, right? It's is he gonna stick behind the plates? And I again you've got Adley Rutschman there in the major leagues. Obviously, he doesn't need to be the full time catcher. As long as he is good enough to be a part time catcher in the major leagues, like that's fantastic. We do know he plays a very good first base. He is a lot of fun to watch over there, extremely athletic and, and spry on his feet for being such a massive human being. Uh, so I, I think that gives him a pretty sturdy floor defensively. This kid is still so much younger than his peers and is is dominating. He gets up to AAA, and yeah, the numbers at, as of right now don't look great in AAA, but he's still like not even 21 years old. In AAA, having like what five, six, seven multi-hit games, like he's he's performing in bunches, and I just like I I, I just love if you pull if you go over to Fangraphs and you read up his his prospect report, it's just I hadn't read this in a while, and I brought it back up because it's so much fun to read. It's I mean they call him a gear wearing Rafael Devers. The swing is it looks a lot like Devers. Uh, plus plus power projection. And already his exit velo numbers are plus on the major league scale that he was putting those up as a teenager in double A this year. Like that's Samuel Basayo for you. Um, yeah, this, this kid's ceiling, we can't even see the ceiling. It's so high. I, I feel pretty confident in saying that, that given his age and production at the levels he's reached this year, like I, you hear all the, the Devers comp there. You hear people talk about, is he our Jordan Alvarez? I don't, I don't know. He's going to be our Sammy Basayo. That's all I know. And I'm, I'm glad that the Orioles didn't, you know, say, screw it. Let's push the chips in and, and move Basayo for a crochet or a scuba or something. I'm glad he's still an Oriole for, for right now. Hopefully he, he continues to be an Oriole. But I'm glad he's still in this organization because he's going to be in the major leagues next year. I have pretty much no doubt about that. 
Absolutely agree with everything you said. Let me just go to Fangraph's player page here. Samuel Basayo, org, org rank one, overall rank one. Oh, that's in the majors. That's number another number one prospect for the Orioles. Makes sense. They also have Kobe Mayo ninth and Heston Kirst at twelfth, by the way. So, just because these players graduate when they make the majors doesn't mean the talent in the organization goes away. It's still there. Yeah, I don't think, you know, some people might nitpick Pisayo's 2024 season. I will not be one of them. If he was on a normal player progression, he would be just dominating high A again this year, maybe getting to double A. But no, he's pushed all the way to triple A now, got off to a slow start, but has had multiple multi hit games since uh, getting up to Norfolk. Hopefully ends on a strong note. Maybe goes to Arizona Fall League. We'll see. That would that would be exciting but uh yeah i just think samuel basayo he's the next it's kind of like he might become underrated just because it's like the orioles really they have another one and i don't know maybe he won't get hyped up like some of the other guys before him have but i'm no less excited about samuel basayo than i was for jackson holiday and gunner henderson before him i think he's of that caliber of prospect and kobe mayo and adley rutschman so the Orioles might be struggling right now, but the future is still very, very bright. I know we've talked about this before, especially at the beginning of the year, probably at some point during during the season. But now, given where he's ending the year, new ownership in place, everything else, do you guys envision a a a chance that Basayo gets one of those you know extensions that we were talking about earlier in the year? Could he be a guy this off season? The Orioles extend, do you guys feel more or less uh, confident in that potentially happening? I'm extremely confident. It might not happen this offseason, might not happen going into this year, but I would be absolutely shocked if Samuel Basaya wasn't an Oriole into his 30s, just because I think it would be such a huge statement to say, we brought in the international scouting department, we found Samuel Basayo, he flew through our system, He's the first international star of the Orioles, and boom, he's here for the bulk of his career. I think that would just be really important to sell the future of the international program and just, yeah, I think it's it's a no-brainer for me. And stolen from the Yankees. I do think that it could happen. I agree with Bob, though, that I don't think it happens this offseason, only because I think that if you see Basayo in 2025, it's going to be very late in the year because there are still questions about his defense and for me it's a little bit hard to pick that part of his game apart because we don't have a lot of the advanced data publicly available and not to mention with catcher defense sometimes it's a little hard to evaluate because there's so much emphasis on pitch framing when by the time Basayo gets to the major leagues pitch framing might not matter anymore because the automated ball strike system so you've got to factor that in too when you're looking at a player that's this young and probably still two years away from being at least a part-time catcher in the major leagues. But yes, I do think that he's a perfect candidate for a, you know, eight year extension before he even plays a game in the majors or even after just a couple of weeks in the majors, because of all the points Bob touched on the fact that that left-handed power is going to play at the major league level. There's no question about that. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify is there to help you grow. Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms and sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. What I love about Shopify is how no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash westwood1. All lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash westwood1 now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash westwood1. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. 
My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. Hear that? Pumpkin. That's fall calling. And the pumpkin spice latte is back at Starbucks. From that first sweater to late autumn weather, it's all of fall in just one sip. Order ahead on the Starbucks app. At Amica Insurance, we know it's more than just a car or a house. It's the four wheels that get you where you're going and the four walls that welcome you home. When you combine auto and home insurance with Amica, we'll help protect it all. And the more you cover, the more you can save. Amica. Empathy is our best policy. I'll go now to two more position players, and they kind of are on different ends of the spectrum at this point in their development, but both are pretty highly regarded prospects. That's Judd Fabian and Frederick Ben Cosme. Fabian went back to Bowie after a long stint there in 2023 where the swing and miss issues that have really surrounded him since his days at Florida were on full display, even if he was showing some power and drawing a lot of walks. And while you might look at Fabian and see that he hit only hit 233 during his time with the Bay Sox, I don't think that tells the whole story, given that the strikeouts did go down and the power actually improved a little bit. He got a promotion to AAA Norfolk around the same time as Basayo, so he's getting a cameo there to end the year. Ben Cosme, meanwhile, got off to a scorching start at the plate this year before cooling off a little bit over the summer and then picking up the production again late in the year. It was very similar to Dylan Beavers. In Ben Cosme's case, though, he did this as a 21-year-old who had not played above A ball prior to this season after spending all of 2023 at Aberdeen. And he's the guy that the Orioles have moved aggressively. He went to Delmarva in 2022 after just two games in the FCL, ended that season at, at Aberdeen, played there all of last year as a 20-year-old, and then had all of 2024 in Bowie as a 21-year-old. So let's start with Fabian in this group. How did you guys feel about his development over the course of this year with Bowie? I felt better. Uh, I mean, the power was definitely a big thing for me. I I think he looked more confident. Uh, the type of power hitter that, of course, the wall is going to have some sort of impact, but that's a guy that if he's in the major league with the Orioles, uh, that's the kind of right-handed, right-handed power you want in the system. I know, you know Kobe Mayo, that right-handed power is like the – what we all like that that's the gold standard for right-handed power in the organization, but don't sleep on Judd Fabian. I, I feel like Fabian's, you know, the power gets overlooked. I feel like the defense gets overlooked because everybody immediately just points to Enrique Bradfield Jr. I, meanwhile, Fabian is right there in, in terms of the power. He's right there in terms of the fielding, the speed as well. He doesn't have the extreme stolen base totals, but he's an athlete. I almost feel like it's, it's in that Austin Hayes type mold with his like athleticism and his grit out there. Um, you know, the strikeout rate was better when it was, when he was in Bowie this year, the walk rate was down a lot, but home run numbers were better. The strikeout numbers were better. He was still at a 117 WRC plus in Bowie this year, triple A. It is what it is. A hundred plate appearances. And he's, he's back to striking out 42% of the time and only at a 34 WRC plus right now. But I, I'm going to say, I don't care. But he's he's taking his lumps now. I'm excited to see what Fabian can do uh, next year. If he can just be a league average bat with that power, the speed, that defense, and the strikeout rate isn't insane, like I, I think this is a guy who's going to make a pretty big impact at the major league level. And, and I feel like his performance this year in Double A specifically, I feel a lot better this year than I did last year about him. Yeah, I agree. I think I've said it before and I stand by it. I think he's going to be the perfect fourth outfielder while he's in his optionable, controllable years, cheap years for the Orioles. And he's got the upside to be more than that. So you start there and, you know, the Ryan, he's going to be Ryan McKenna if Ryan McKenna had upside, basically. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty happy with Fabian's year. Yeah, we, I figured the strikeouts were going to go back up quite a bit moving up to triple a with those refined pitchers 
who can exploit his weaknesses, but we saw him cut his strikeout rate by looks like what eight or nine percent from double A from year to year. If he could do something similar, as long as he's around 30 percent strikeout rate, I think he'll be more than okay. So, yeah, I, I think Fabian, bare minimum, is going to be a great fourth outfielder. And like I said, if he figures out a thing or two about swinging and, and making more contact, not missing as much, then I think he could be a regular uh, at the major league level. Let's talk about Ben Cosme for a moment. And one thing that I neglected to mention earlier was the defensive angle of this because Ben Cosme had a career high for the number of games he played at shortstop this season, 79. That's up from 58 a year ago at Aberdeen. And one of the things we've always kind of questioned with Ben Cosme is where is he going to stick? We know it's going to be somewhere in the infield, but is it going to be second? Is it going to be third? Is it going to be short? And there's been some doubts about the shortstop defense, and I've raised some of them over the course of this year. But I think the fact that the Orioles gave him a lot of exposure there means that they're at least not giving up on the idea. But taking Ben Cosme on the whole, do you guys feel like he stayed the course this year or that his prospect stock has actually improved? I think it's improved a little bit. If you look at his year to year, look, again, 21 years old this entire year. To be at double A, that's that's pretty much he's being pushed and he's holding his own. Like last year in high A, he was 20. He had an 88 WRC plus. This year, 21 in double A, he has a 94 WRC plus. So still below average. And it's actually funny. He, in 2023 and 2024, he had 18 doubles, three triples, 28 stolen bases, identical both years. But this year he had eight home runs compared to just two last year. So he's tapping into the, the natural power a little bit more. I think you saw signs towards the end of the season of improvement. I think he he uh, he had a, a pretty good last month or two of the year, and he'll be 22 coming into next year. I'm sure he'll repeat double A, and, and hopefully he just continues to improve on these numbers. He had the best ISO of his career other than the complex league for two games in 2022. Uh, he still doesn't strike out very much at all, 16.3% of the time, and still walks above average Emmer's 10%. Yeah, I'm still a fan. I think he's a middle infielder with offensive upside. Again, a, another future great role player, bench player, what have you, utility guy on, on a good team. So, yeah, I, I'm very happy with Ben Cosme's development. Yeah, I, I think he took a step forward this year just because, he, to me, he proved that I feel a lot more confident in saying that he has a future career as a utility type player in the major leagues and him being able to showcase that he could handle shortstop on a semi-regular basis, I think just adds to that even more. Um, League average bat being two and a half years younger than his peers at double a I'll take it. Like you said, he has been pushed very aggressively from the start. And so I think the Orioles are doing that for a reason because they are very high on him. I always had pretty big questions about Ben Cosme but you, know, you see some of these national outlets again, going back to baseball in America, like had him pretty highly ranked for you know the last two years or so, much more aggressive than what I was willing to put him on my own personal list. But that was comforting to see that, like he, he's going to steal bases, tapping into a little bit more power, like you mentioned. You love to see that the walk and strikeout numbers are still great. I know he prides himself on those strikeout numbers. He prides himself on staying healthy this year. I think I saw some some post earlier this week from him saying healthy was key for him like and just doing what he's doing he continues to just roll along um i I think considering the role that i envision him fulfilling at the next level his age and what he did in double a this year i think he gets uh, an a for the year like he had a fantastic season all all that considered i i do still want to go back though and look at his splits as a leadoff hitter versus elsewhere in the lineup because i feel like when ben cosme was in the leadoff spot he thrived in that role. I, I don't have the hard numbers to prove that claim, but I feel like you saw Ben Cosme go in like a two, three week stretch where, you know, the offense wasn't that great, but he's batting, you know, in the, in the bottom of the lineup or something. And then he hit lead off for like two weeks in a row and he's putting up uh, like 10, 15 hits across a three week period. Uh, I, don't, I don't get, I don't have the hard data to back that up, but all things considered, Ben Cosme had a, had a pretty great year in my opinion. 
Yeah, I expect that the middle infield you saw at Bowie to end this season is going to be the one you see at the beginning of next year with Carter Young and Frederick Ben Cosme playing either side of the second base bag most nights. But if Ben Cosme can go there, and I don't think this is far-fetched, if he can go there and put up back-to-back good months to start the year, kind of check off some of these boxes, I think that he could end up spending at least half or close to half of next year in AAA. Does that seem unrealistic to you guys? I don't think so. I I think this is a guy who they really like to take over that utility role at the AAA level, move him around a little bit and be a reserve bat for them. Or even a guy who like you push aggressively and you show that hit tool, a guy who can play three, four positions, get on base, steal bags, not strike out. Like, that's also a guy, if there's not going to be a role for him in the major leagues this year, that's a guy that other teams are going to covet as well. And he could really like beef up a future trade. Like Ben Cosme is going to add value to this organization in one way or the other. Yeah, like Nick said, I think they're pushing him for a reason. I think they see that he responds well to the challenge of that. So yeah, I, I definitely agree. Could see him in triple A for for half of twenty twenty five. I think before we wrap this up, we'll just mention a couple of late season cameos that some players had in Bowie after they were promoted from Aberdeen. Enrique Bradfield Jr. basically got a month's worth of games up there, appearing in 27 contests for the Bay Sox. Did very well there, hitting 284 to 791 OPS, stealing 15 bags in 19 attempts. And Creed Willems showing some power, four home runs in 16 games for the Bay Sox. And Kind of uh, reversing a little bit of a trend that we've seen, which is that those first weeks or months for Wilms when he goes to a new level tend to be a struggle. And although this is a very small sample size, ends up looking pretty promising for Creed. So I know we talked about both of them a lot last week when we recapped Aberdeen, but any final thoughts on Bradfield or Wilms? Bradfield looks as advertised. I think more walks and strikeouts. They're showing off the speed. ISO was even over 100. So, yeah, I think that's just a great jumping off point for him coming into next year and continuing to improve. And, yeah, like Vivek says, Willems feels like a next year full breakout, like big-time breakout guy. I could definitely see that strikeout rate. Yeah, again, 69 plate appearances, but 18.8% strikeout rate, and that's pretty good for a power hitter he only walked like three percent of the time but again small sample size we know he he walks more than that he'll be at least league average when it comes to that department a 111 wrc plus so yeah gotta love it uh great jumping off point for him as well and even i gotta say douglas hodo really ended his double a tenure strong only 49 plate appearances but a 121 wrc plus 779 ops six doubles in a home run in only 49 plate appearances, five stolen bases as well. So we'll continue to shout him out. Uh, Yeah, I think the last week or two was really good for these guys. Yeah, I was going to bring up Doug Hodo, just like six-round pick out of Texas in 2022. Same draft with his his teammate, Silas Ardoy there. The glove was highlighted coming out of the draft, but this guy had a 131 WRC plus in high A this year with a 19% walk rate and 42 stolen bases. Those are absurd numbers, and he's hitting the ball very well in double-A to close out the year. But yeah, Creed, like I I said the other week, uh, the biggest thing that stood out to me about Creed Willems this year in high eight was the strikeout rate going from 27.7% down to 20.9%, and that's even lower in a very small sample size this year. In double-A already, love to see that. And with Enrique Bradfield Jr., I I still have a lot of questions. He still has a lot to answer. He still has a long way to go. But I had so many more questions coming into this year. And in 27 games, 120 plate appearances, so small sample size, but decent amount there. He is at he has a 133 WRC plus with Bowie. More walks than strikeouts and a 287 average. Like I did not expect Enrique Bradfield to put up those kind of numbers in double A to close out the year. I am more than ecstatic about that. And uh, I'm pretty stoked to see what changes, uh, not even changes, what progress he makes this offseason and what type of hitter he looks like next year. Because I I think in terms of these bigger like hitting prospects, I think Enrique Bradfield Jr. was, was probably 
one of the guys who took the biggest leaps forward this year, in my opinion, which is really good to see considering he was a first round draft pick last year. And that first pick of we're not picking at the top of the draft anymore. What are the Orioles going to do? Enrique Bradford Jr. fell to them. And uh, he's he's showing why that was a a pick that we maybe were scratching our heads a little bit when it happened, but uh, he's he's turning it around here, settling in quite nicely. And with that, that does it for this week's episode. We will be back next week to recap Norfolk season. And of course, bring you the latest news here in Birdland. In the meantime, you can check us out on our many social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, Threads, X, TikTok, and YouTube. We're also over at Substack, Orioles on the Birds com, And while you're browsing the internet, be sure to sign up to become a member of our Patreon community. You can do so for as little as $3 a month and save the state on your calendar. It's October 14th at 6 p.m. We will be having a live show at Secret Spot Brewing. We will have more details for you between now and the show. So look forward to social media posts from us, as well as announcements in episode about our plans for that live show, our second one of 2024. We'll be very happy to be back at Checker Spot in just about a month. For Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to Orioles on the Birds, presented by Bet Online and part of the Believe Podcast Network. Every day, our world gets a little more connected, but a little further apart. But then there are moments that remind us to be more human. Thank you for calling Amica Insurance. Hey, uh, I was just in an accident. Don't worry, we'll get you taken care of. At Amica, we understand that looking out for each other isn't new or groundbreaking. It's human. Amica, empathy is our best policy. Experience the performance of Lexus Racing, the thunderous V8 engine. The black and day glow yellow Lexus RCF GT3, a blur of speed and adrenaline. The sheer force of acceleration. The physics-defying grip of the tires. The intensity of every corner. The precision of each maneuver. The sound of victory. Visit Lexus.com slash motorsports to keep the thrill going. Have you ever considered buying a master tool set? I know, I know, the cost can be crazy, and the financing can leave you with years of payments. But Mega Mod sets from Gear Ranch are different. They deliver the same pro-quality tools as you'll find in most master sets, plus toolboxes for storage and modular foam trays to keep everything organized, all starting at just $39.99. Under $4,000, that's less than you'll pay for just the box from the big guys. See the value in every Megamod set. Shop now at GearWrench.com. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it. Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. We wear our work day by day, stitch by stitch. At Dickies, we believe work is what we're made of. So, whether you're gearing up for a new project or looking to add some tried and true workwear to your collection, remember that Dickies has been standing the test of time for a reason. Their workwear isn't just about looking good. It's about performing under pressure and lasting through the toughest jobs. Head over to Dickies.com and use the promo code WORKWEAR20 at checkout to save 20% on your purchase. It's the perfect time to experience the quality and reliability that has made Dickies a trusted name for over a century.